It's October 19, 2005. Yadier Merlina, in his first full season as the backstop for the Cardinals, lofts a routine fly ball to right field. Jason Lane settles underneath it to record the final out of the NLCS and send the Houston Astros to their first ever World Series. Right in the middle of that celebration was that night's winning pitcher, Roy Oswald. Oswald allowed just three hits and one earned while striking out six to earn the win in the series clincher. Oswald's stellar performance on the hill earned him a couple of accolades. The first was MVP of the National League Championship Series for his 129 ERA and pair of victories he earned for Houston. The second, and in Oswald's eyes the most important, was a bright yellow Caterpillar D6 and XL Bulldozer. When he first broke into the big leagues, Oswald had a conversation with Astros owner Drayton McLean and told him that one of his goals was to eventually own a bulldozer. The goal was shocking to McLean at first, but for the small town country boy in Oswald, he knew just how envious everyone in his hometown of Weir, Mississippi would be when they saw him rolling around on that dozer. Prior to the eventual series clinching game 6 of the 05 NLCS, McLean approached Oswald and told him that if he sent the Astros to the World Series, then that bulldozer would be all his. Sure enough. Oswald pitched the gem to lead the Astros to the World Series, and two months later, McLean held up his end of the bargain. But Roy Oswald was more than just the guy who got a bulldozer. Known as a durable and reliable pitcher, he was one of the best arms of his era. Consistently in the running for the Cy Young Award, Oswald put together arguably the most dominant and underrated careers in recent memory. Weir, Mississippi is small, even for a small town. It doesn't have a traffic light, only a four-way stop sign, and has a population around 500 people. Weir High School, which closed its doors in 2012, normally graduated around 30 to 50 kids a year. Weir High had an excellent football program during its tenure, winning six 1A state titles in Mississippi. On their 1994 state championship team was a small wideout and D-back named Roy Oswald. Oswald was a standout football player, but his heart was always drawn to baseball. When Oswald entered high school, Weir didn't have a baseball program. As a 15-year-old, he was throwing over 90 miles an hour and knew that he had something special and needed to play high school ball. So, Roy's father got in front of the school board and pitched his case, no pun intended, to start a baseball program at Weir. The board approved the Oswald's request on one condition, that Roy's father, who was a logger by trade, cleared out some of the trees so that a baseball field can be constructed. And thus, Weir High High School had a baseball team, and Roy was the stud, but despite pitching in nearly every game and having a fastball touching the upper 90s, he saw little college interest. Nearby Holmes Community College gave the scrawny right-hander a shot, and after one stellar Juco season, the Houston Astros made Oswald their 23rd round draft pick in the 1996 MLB Draft. Oswald had longed to play for the Mississippi State Bulldogs, and had signed a letter of intent after his season at Holmes, but a half million dollar signing bonus from the Astros enticed Oswald to go pro and forego his commitment. Oswald began his professional career as a 19-year-old in 1997, and quickly rose up through the Astros organization. Two years later, he was pitching an A-ball, and towards the latter half of the season, he began noticing some pain in his shoulder. He'd fight through the pain and finish the season out, but was convinced that something in his arm was torn. He'd made plans to see a doctor a month or so after the season had ended, with the likely scenario that Oswald would need surgery to repair whatever was bothersome in his shoulder. One day, prior to seeing his doctor, Oswald was working on his truck and went to go check on his spark plugs. He grabbed one of the wires, which happened to be live, and suddenly, Oswald had bursts of electricity running through his body. His hand tightened up and gripped the wire even harder, and for almost a full minute, Oswald was being electrocuted. After slipping off the bumper he was standing on, he was finally freed from the wire and noticed that the pain in his shoulder was gone. The electric shock had loosened up and cleared some scar tissue which was building up in his shoulder and causing him that pain. After about a week of throwing and not having any pain in his shoulder, Oswald cancelled his doctor's appointment and he hasn't had any pain in his shoulder since, saying, My truck done shocked the fire out of me. My arm don't hurt no more. That burst of electricity not only repaired his arm, but jolted his career. He pitched the 2000 season in the minors, collecting a gold medal for the United States in the 2000 Summer Olympics in the process, before getting the call to the majors in early 2001. Oswald came into a solid Houston rotation and immediately made an impact. He'd go 14-3 during his rookie year, with his 824 winning percentage leading the National League. He tallied just over a strikeout per inning and sported a 273 ERA, 170 ERA+, plus, and a 284 FIP as he introduced himself to the league. His stellar season earned him a 5th place finish in the Cy Young Award voting, and a 22nd place finish in the MVP voting. He would have been the NL Rookie of the Year in just about every other season, but decided to make his debut the same year that Albert Pujols did. Oswald had come into the league with a vengeance, and it was a sign of more than a decade of pure dominance from Houston's ace. Despite not pitching in the major leagues during the 2000 season, 
Roy Oswalt was one of the best pitchers of that decade. He posted a winning season at each of the nine seasons he pitched in during the 2000s, picking up three All-Star nods, placed in the top five of the NL Cy Young Award voting five times, and finished in the top 25 for the NL MVP voting four times. After pitching a perfect first inning on June 11, 2003, Oswalt exited his start against the New York Yankees, and the Astros' bullpen went on to pitch eight hitless innings to complete the combined no-hitter. It was the 10th no-hitter in Astros franchise history, and the final no-no the Astros threw as a National League club. He notched his first career 21 season in 2004, and followed that up with another 21 season in 2005, while leading the Astros to their first ever World Series and picking up his bulldozer in the process. He led the National League in ERA the following year in 2006, and it seemed that each year Oswalt was getting better and better. When Shane Victorino grounded out to Robinson Cano to give the Yankees a 27th World Series championship, it officially ended the first decade of the new millennium. When you think of the best pitchers from that era, the first that usually come to mind are those in the Hall of Fame. The Roy Hallidays, the Randy Johnsons, the Pedro Martinez's. Perhaps you think of the Cy Young winners in Johan Santana, or Brandon Webb, or even Jake Peavy. But Oswalt falls into the latter category. The non-Hall of Famer who never won a major award and was just dominant his entire career. There were 105 pitchers to throw a thousand or more innings over the 2000s, and Oswalt was among the top 10 in nearly every major pitching category that decade. His 3.23 ERA was third among the qualified arms, trailing only Pedro and Johan. The 1.34 ERA plus he posted was tied for fifth best of the decade with Roger Clemens and another Roy in Roy Halladay. He posted the sixth best FIP among those qualified arms, trailing only four Hall of Famers and somebody who certainly has Hall of Fame numbers in Kurt Schilling. The 137 games he won and 662 winning percentage he accumulated were both the fifth most in the 2000s, and the 1,473 hitters he struck out were the ninth most in the decade. Halfway through the 2010 season, Oswalt was dealt to the Philadelphia Phillies, who were fresh off back-to-back -back World Series appearances and had hoped that Oswalt could be that missing piece they needed. He'd spend the remainder of the 2010 season and the entire 2011 season in Philly, where he shared the rotation with Roy Halladay, Cliff Lee, and Cole Hamels. Pretty good foursome if you ask me. He'd pitch for the Texas Rangers during the 2012 season, and then for the Colorado Rockies before retiring at the end of the 2013 season. Upon his retirement, Oswald had posted an even 50 career war which was the highest war for anyone in the 1996 MLB draft class. Being the 684th overall pick in the 23rd round, Oswald became the lowest drafted player to lead his draft class in war in the history of the draft era. His 13-year career lasted from 2001 to 2013, and during his time in the major leagues, he was arguably the best and most durable pitcher in the game. Of the 18 pitchers to throw at least 2,000 innings during that time frame, Oswalt was among the leaders in every major pitching statistic. Trailing only Roy Halladay, Oswalt was second in ERA with a 3.36, ERA Plus with a 127, and FIP with a 3.37. The 1,852 hitters he struck out were fifth most, along with the 163 games he won and his 6.15 winning percentage. He held hitters to an 85 OPS Plus during his career which is the fourth best of pitchers during his career, which amassed 2,245 in the third innings. While Oswalt stacks up well against pitchers of his era, he also holds his own historically. Of the 343 pitchers with at least 2,200 career innings pitched, Oswalt racked up the 100th most career strikeouts, ahead of 25 current Hall of Famers. He owns the same career ERA plus as Kurt Schilling, Tom Seaver, and Bob Gibson, tied for the 27th highest among pitchers with at least 2,200 innings pitched and better than 43 Hall of Famers. He's tied with three others, including Zach Greinke, for 145th overall with a 3.36 ERA, lower than 13 Hall of Fame pitchers, including his former teammate in Roy Halladay. His 3.37 FIP is again tied with Greinke for the 126th best in baseball history, better than 23 pitchers with their plaques already in Cooperstown. His 6.15 winning percentage is tied for 45th best, besting 43 inductees. Essentially, the man knew how to win ball games and was elite at preventing runners from not only scoring, but reaching base. I'm not saying Roy Oswalt's a Hall of Famer. He did appear on the 2019 ballot, but after receiving just four votes, he fell off after just that one year. His 10-year peak was absolutely dominant, but in an era filled with electric arms, he was never able to separate himself from the pack or really have long-term success. The shortness of his career also hurts his chances. But just because he isn't a Hall of Famer doesn't mean we shouldn't appreciate how great he was. He was a bulldog, a scrapper, a man who shouldn't have made it, but in turn, was one of the best of his generation. 
He went to a high school that didn't have a baseball team, then to a community college to get drafted in the 23rd round. A faulty spark plug kept his career alive, and he went toe-to-toe -to -toe against some of the best pitchers in the National League every year, narrowly missing out on the Cy Young Award each season. He was a force to be reckoned with, and while his career was relatively short, he still retired as one of the most accomplished pitchers of the new millennium.